Um, I should have mentioned before, uh, we do have some distinguished guests with us today from the What Works Cities Initiative. So just welcoming them as travelers to our uh, community uh, since we're on that topic. So uh, with that, that moves us into the objective on uh, the airport facilities. So Justin. Okay. Hi, good morning, Justin Meyer, uh, Aviation Department, Deputy Director of Aviation, Marketing, Air Service, Customer Service, Public Relations. Uh, our goal you, you get is a paycheck for each of those titles? No. Uh, our goal is to develop a plan that identifies the steps necessary to insert, ensure a 21st century airport for business and leisure. Uh, and I'm, I'm very pleased to report that there's been some significant steps taken forward on this since our last April 2017 update. Uh, those included an unsolicited proposal from someone looking to partner with us to create, uh, to design, uh, construct, and finance a new terminal. It, in that time period, well. we've also had a, um, an RFPQ, RFQP process request for proposals and qualifications uh, that has concluded. Our council voted unanimously to move forward ballot language for a November 7th election regarding a new terminal at KCI. And, um, and just, uh, just two weeks ago, uh, council had a majority vote to accept the, the recommendation of the selection committee for Edgemore to be the, uh, the partner to develop, uh, design, construct, and finance a new single terminal at Kansas City Airport. The good news is by the time we meet again for our next Casey stat in April of 2018, uh, hopefully we'll really be able to put a big check, check mark uh, next to this, uh, this goal. Justin, I'm assuming that um, you have this information that you've shown on this first slide without the uh, editorializing at the top somewhere, right? Just the information at the bottom you've compiled here. Mm -hmm. Do you have this? Yeah. Can you get that to me? Yes, yeah, certainly. In a uh, digital form? Yes, sir. Thank you. That to you uh, as soon as I get back. Might uh, be others as well. Yep. So really t to, to achieve this goal, it's, uh, this slide is to uh, really define what a 21st century airport is, and that is one that, that meets the needs of an evolving industry. And I think uh, we can all agree that the airline industry has evolved quite substantially from, uh, from where we were when our facility opened uh, in 1972, and we'll talk about some of those <coughs> metrics. Uh, when we look at um, airports in our peer group, they continue to be recognized for excellence. They are airports such as Tampa, Indianapolis, Portland, uh, Dallas Love Field and others. The most recent uh, survey that came out has been the JD Power survey, which uh, was published just just about a week ago, and uh, and Kansas City International Airport ranked 20. I'm sorry, 15 of 21 airports. Our uh, our score of 742 was down two points from the previous year. Um, so but our we'll, score hasn't changed significantly. No, it's in just fact, our scores, scores have made. That's right. Great. Scores have improved uh, quite a bit across the board as, as other airports in our peer group have made significant improvements on their, on their facilities. And next slide, we'll talk a little bit about some of the significant improvements that we've made to our existing facilities uh, that are in operation terminals B and C. Uh, some of the recent improvements include about $5 million that we spent uh, consolidating the nine-gate departure lounge. If you remember back to 26 April uh, 2016, American Airlines stood in front of full council and said they want to fly more in Kansas City than they can. The facility is holding them back from doing what they want to do in terms of uh, aircraft size. They wanted to be operating larger aircraft, and it was not possible for them to get enough passengers through the security checkpoint because the security checkpoint was small. <coughs> so what we did is we consolidated a Frontier, Spirit, and Americans gate area into one large gate area, constructed a significantly larger bag belt, and added pre-check for, uh, for those airlines. Uh, in addition, uh, we added uh, our first room for nursing moms and our first service animal relief area. Uh, those are available to the passengers flying those four airlines. Uh, unfortunately, if you're not flying those four airlines, you don't have access to that amenity. Uh, and that's one of the restrictions we have with the, just the confined space that we have inside the, the gate areas that we're operating. Uh, we've also improved the curbside lighting. So if you're doing a drop off or pick up uh, early in the morning, the, the lights, the fluorescent lights that used to barely light up the curb are now throwing great light all the way to the island. Uh, after three lanes, we've uh, upgraded our Wi-Fi, which still is complimentary and 
Uh, just last week, I was bumping into speeds of about 60 megabytes per second down, which is a significant upgrade from where we were before. And just uh, just last week, uh, TNI approved a um, Ten million dollar project to improve our international arrivals area and the gate 90 uh, setup. Uh, we've been working with um, the federal inspection station and <coughs> CBP Customs and Border Patrol um, protection. I'm sorry to uh, to bring that facility up to date. One of the one of the issues we have as we're dealing with the recruitment of international carriers is the inefficiency of the way that gate 90 operates, where currently it is a deplaning only gate. Uh, meaning that you can arrive and unload an aircraft, but then you've got to tow that aircraft to another gate to board it. Uh, that's very inefficient, and uh, and this uh, solution that is underway now will uh, will resolve that hopefully by summer of 2018. We talked about changes in the airline industry, and this is a chart that outlines load factor in the teal columns versus seats per departure on average aircraft at Kansas City International Airport in the blue line. And you can see the trend since 2007 has been larger aircraft. Um, we're up to 129 seats year to date. Then the month of October, we're at 133 seats per departure, and that is, again, an average number. Our largest aircraft have, uh, have about 200 seats per departure. So when one of those is operating at, uh, on, a, on a Friday or a Sunday or a Monday, some of our peak days at 100% load factor, that means there's 200 people in a gate area that really only has about 150 seats. And uh, that's, that's negatively impacting several of our scores, as we'll see as we go forward. One thing I want to point out before we leave this slide, though, is just the, our largest carrier, Southwest Airlines. Uh, their fleet is exclusively 737s. Uh, they did a, something pretty momentous uh, just over this past weekend where they retired their remaining 737-300 aircraft, which had 143 seats, and replaced them with uh, larger aircraft turning on their new Boeing 737 MAX aircraft, which have 175 seats. And when we look at last week to this week, we had eight aircraft that were previously operating at 140. 43 seats that are now operating in today's schedule at 175 seats. So the move to larger aircraft is continuing and continuing and is, again, negatively <coughs> impacting our score as we're unable to scale our, our uh, limited gate areas to accommodate the larger and more full aircraft. One last point here is uh, you see the the 68, 69 percent load factor in 2004. Again, when Kansas City International <coughs> Airport opened in 1972, industry load factors averaged about 50 percent, and the airplane side was about 80 seats per departure, which meant on average our typical flight had 40 people on it. Uh, today, our typical flight has over 100 people on it, which means the increase is about 2.5 times. Uh, and you can see where our where our issues are as we uh, we deal with the facility there. Okay. Just some, okay, the new fleet, Southwest new fleet is what what uh, class plane it's a it's still a 737 but it's a larger 737 800 is what they've replaced these smaller 300s with and those aircraft have an additional 32 seats so the total seats are 175 thanks yep and the average holding area <coughs> seats about 150 uh, 120 really 120. Is, is about the number uh, I was just at gate 37 this morning which is one of Southwest smallest is right next to the little restaurant uh, that's there and the restrooms and that that gate area uh, when gate 8 when gate 38 in use really only has about 50 seats so that's a common um, customer sitting on the floor spot for us all right on the next slide, we kind of already talked about this. This is just passengers per departure, and as I mentioned, that number has has grown up to over uh, over 100, and uh, and is causing us some some problems. And the trend towards it in the industry is that aircraft will continue to get larger, and air, airlines will continue to um, sell as many seats as possible at the right price as they get better at revenue management <coughs> and driving load factors. So that we expect to see that trend uh, continue. On the next slide, we'll see emplanements or the number of passengers who get on an aircraft in, in Kansas City, and we have seen several uh, several consecutive years of growth. In fact, uh, last month when we announced August 2017 traffic, it was our 40th consecutive month of year-over-year -year growth, which is really quite staggering for us, uh, something that hasn't taken place since the mid-90s at Kansas City International Airport. Uh, 2016 finished up 5.4 percent from 2015. 2017 is tracking up about that exact same number uh, from where 2016 finished. So we finished with about 11 million total passengers last year. We'll expect to see about 11.4 
five, maybe 11.6 million passengers in 2017, and that will put, put 2017 probably in the top four busiest years on record at Kansas City International Airport. Uh, one thing that I do want to point out, though, despite the fact that we have had 40 months of consecutive year-over-year -year growth uh, in the single digits, uh, it, it doesn't mean that we're at the head of the class. Uh, there are several airports that have passed us, and in terms of total passengers in 2016, Raleigh-Durham International Airport passed Kansas City International Airport. Uh, we are now the 43rd busiest airport in North America. It wasn't uh, just 2007 when we were the 37th busiest airport in terms of passengers in, in North America. We've been passed by Raleigh-Durham, we've been passed by Nashville, we've been passed by New Orleans, we've been passed by Oakland, Houston Hobby, and Dallas Love Field in the last six years. I'm sorry, in the last 10 years. Okay, uh, flipping over now to looking at citizen satisfaction scores. Um, overall scores are relatively high. Uh, overall satisfaction uh, has regressed from 2013 at 74% to 67% in 2017. Uh, the category which regularly scores the lowest um, in the citizen satisfaction survey is food, beverage, and other concessions with, uh, with never more than 45% of, of our citizens being satisfied with, uh, with, with that. We have made some significant changes over the last few years to work to improve that. In fact, we've added uh, a new restaurant behind security in the, um, in the, uh, in the Frontier Allegiant Spirit area that it, re restaurant used to be pre-security and now it's post-security so there's an additional amenity there uh, and we have uh, closed gate 87 which was previously leased by American Airlines which had extremely limited restrooms and uh, and concessions available so we are working to improve that uh, and it's disappointing to see that that score is not increasing on the next slide is just a preliminary look at the first quarter 2018 data, uh, which shows overall satisfaction um, takes a significant hit uh, of 10%, uh, where it moves to uh, from 67 in fiscal 17 to, uh, I'm sorry, 67 in fiscal 17 to 57 in fiscal 18, um, which is uh, which is a concern. Uh, overall, very dissatisfied and dissatisfied increases as well. Um, we have seen uh, these, these trends reflected in some of the other studies that we're doing, such as our Wi-Fi uh, survey. Uh, there's been a very public conversation over the last six months about, uh, about what the airport is and what it isn't, uh, what it delivers and what it doesn't, and what opportunities there are to make it better. And I believe that those conversations are very likely changing some public perception, and I think that that's reflected in the score here. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the community listing sessions, which is another thing that took place since our April 2017 Casey stat. Uh, we did 43 community listing sessions, met with over 1,600 residents of the city of Kansas City, Missouri, and had meetings in every uh, council district. We also uh, had uh, the participants complete a little bit of a survey while we were there, which is on the next slide, um, and just to ask some similar questions actually to what the citizen satisfaction survey uh, asks, uh, in addition several others. We had 800, over 800 total respondents. Uh, it was interesting to see that there was a large percentage that had flown one to zero times in the last 12 months. Uh, but on average, re uh, the respondents of the survey said that they flew over six times per year uh, from Kansas City International Airport. Uh, we asked on a couple categories that I mentioned. We'll flip over. The first one is uh, how satisfied are you with parking? Um, and uh, that overall score was 3.4 of 5, where 1 is 0 and 5 is, oh, I'm sorry, 1 is poor and 5 is excellent. 3 would be average, so that is an above average score. But if you notice across the bottom, departures by by frequency satisfaction regresses the more frequently you use the airport and that's something that we've also seen through other surveys uh, our business travelers or out-of-town guests are the least satisfied people at our facility the local travelers who are infrequent travelers are the most satisfied passengers at our facility and you'll see this pretty consistent across the board the next slide looks at uh, uh, at concessions, and we knew that this was the negative, uh, the negative um, one from the citizen satisfaction survey. It's also negative here, again, with the most frequent users being the least satisfied with that. On the next slide, we look at uh, the overall cleanliness. This is an above average score. Again, the more frequent users are the least satisfied. 
and overall satisfaction here uh, is below average 2.8 percent or 2.8 of 5 average again is 3 and you can see that uh, again the same trend exam exists the more frequently you use the airport the least satisfied you are with Kansas City International Airport um, the last question that we asked uh, was what's one word that you would use to describe Kansas City International Airport and this is just a word cloud uh, where larger words reflect more frequency of use uh, convenient was the largest uh, and the most frequently used word uh, that people used to describe the airport but also outdated old easy adequate and small were some of uh, some of the others th that were, were commonly said I don't have it in this presentation but in, in the August 10th presentation to the airport committee I detailed how uh, frequent users versus non frequent users and how those two word clouds separated uh, with, uh, with old outdated and inadequate being among the most frequently used terms for the the frequent users of our facility and I think that might be my last slide. Oh, next steps. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to kick off uh, that $10 million, $11 million program to, uh, to fix Gate 90 in the International Arrivals uh, Facility. Uh, I did meet just last week with several international carriers talking about the international opportunities to Kansas City. We are the largest airport in terms of pa passengers uh, that does not have transatlantic flights. So we are, um, are working to move forward on that. The existing facility does not prohibit us from being successful recruiting international carriers. For example, I would point to the new service that we have starting in February to Punta Cana in the Dominican. But it's important that we recognize that some of the issues that we have in the existing facilities will be exacerbated by larger transatlantic aircraft when we have um, gate areas that do not have enough seats and gate areas that do not have enough concessions and gate areas that do not have enough restrooms. Those issues will continue to get worse if we don't address it uh, regarding a November 7th election. So looking forward to providing a very positive report to you in April of 2018. All right. Feel, uh, have you? Uh, has anybody ever surveyed the people who actually work at the airport about what they think? Yeah, uh, we. Where's that data? We have that. We have that data. Um, our Wi-Fi survey also asked, "Do you, we can categorize by by do you work here?" Uh, and so that data we have available. I'm happy to get that to you today. Is the are the responses of people who work there materially different from the responses of say a frequent traveler no uh, frequent travelers align very very much with the airport workers it's the infrequent travelers that don't necessarily kind of see, the outliers. don't necessarily see what the security checkpoint looks like at 5 a.m. on a Monday or yeah. what the valet drop off curb looked like this morning at 6 o'clock uh, it the frequent travelers see that they know the issues with B garage being full every week um, so they, their scores and their feedback is much more aligned to the employees who are also seeing the, the airport do what it can and do what it can't do um, on a regular basis. Have you compiled, uh, and, and I know that you have the list of, the, of how airports are being ranked by various ranking agencies, and I think I've seen someplace in the past um, an identifier of which of those airports are relatively new in terms of being constructed. Do you have that? Uh, we, we can identify that. I mentioned Indianapolis. Uh, that's a, a facility that opened in 2008. Dallas Love Field scored very well. That's a facility that opened in the last six years. Uh, Tampa International Airport's a high scorer. They're underway with about a billion dollar uh, terminal renovation program right now. Uh, I can get that to you, yes, sir. Please. Thank you. Thank you. OK, any further questions for Justin? All right, moving on. That was your Twitter feed. I'll, I'll check in here in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks every now and then for coming to the rescue for me. Happy to help. It's, a, it, it, it's important now more than ever to make sure that we're talking about things that are accu accurate and factual. And um, comments such as, a new, we can't get new flights without a new terminal are necessarily true because we have gotten new that's flights. That's true. That's right. Difficult to communicate those kind of things in 140 characters, but uh, I implore Good news, they're increasing to 280. You'll have more opportunities to argue. That, that will help. But I, I just encourage everybody that's that's interested in the in the issue to, to educate themselves on on the facts and uh, and speak truth because um, because the the areas in where our facility is, is failing is uh, is something that we definitely need to address going forward. Okay. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Appreciate it.
All right, that moves us on to place and people-based strategies. And I think first up there is um, Jeffrey Williams of City Planning. Good morning, everyone. Um, spend a few minutes just talking about efforts from city plan development perspective, overall comprehensive planning perspective, and dive into a few corridors that have been defined as uh, underdeveloped or need for revitalization. Um, people are familiar, but it, it bears repeating again. The city's broken to 18 different planning areas. The current status of those areas that we have 14 adopted area plans, meaning we've adopted um, long range plans for those areas uh, within the past um, 10 years. We have four more in process. Um, and we always include an implementation program after the adoption. But if we go to the next slide, we can talk specifically about the four area plans currently underway. We're working uh, up in Shoal Creek. Uh, work on a riverfront industrial area plan spanning both sides of the Missouri River and going down the Blue River, a country club Waldo area we are working on, and then finally Longview. Um, so when we get, and you're seeing some projected adoption dates and completion dates, um, our hope is that by the first quarter of 2018, all those plans will be adopted. And that means that the city has met its goal of having all of its 18 area plans be no more than 10 years old, and then we'll start the cycle again. So I really appreciate all the support we've received as a department to get there. The other piece is about implementation committees. All these plans have implementation steps and, act and actions to them. Those committees are vital to help drive the um, undertaking uh, and completion of some of the goals that are outlined in the plan. And you're seeing three committees there. We have other longstanding committees with some of our other area plans as well, particularly the Greater Downtown Area Plan. Again, looking at underdeveloped corridors, I'm going to pick out four for today. Um, we have a range we've identified about 20 corridors across the city. Um, let's start first with North Oak Trafficway. And again, just wanted to uh, make everybody aware of work that's happening along the corridor. Um, we're at the place now where the city is able to begin implementation of a streetscape plan um, with the utilization of, of GO bonds. Um, about $1.2 million in the first phase of a comprehensive streetscape uh, improvement for the corridor itself. That's also getting coupled with some facade rebate initiatives and sign improvement programs uh, along North Oak, and that's being funded through the, the TIF there. And then we also have been working with, we purchased a former Y building. Uh, the building's been demolished. It's going to convert it into a, a pool and community swim facility. Independence Avenue. Um, there's been a lot of recent attention. Uh, Independence Avenue was uh, mentioned and discussed as part of two larger comprehensive planning projects related to the North Loop. Uh, there's the Pell study that's looking at concepts about um, reimagining the roadway itself, the North Loop, possibly its elimination. But for the purpose of this conversation, it really is a focus about how does Independence Avenue get reconnected between Columbus Park and City Market. Uh, the ULI um, panel was in last week, and interesting about their take on what should happen with North Loop, and one of their key recommendations was really looking at Independence Avenue and its reconnection. They saw that being uh, pivotal to taking all the development energy that's happening in downtown and in River Market and flowing that east into the old, old Northeast. Um, some things we're doing on the avenue related to pedestrian safety. Um, we have a PSP project that's really beginning to dive down, look at key intersections, and see what we can do uh, from a complete streets perspective. And then finally, um, I know there was a review for proposals that came into the KCATA for bus rapid transit. So um, that is a line, it's the fifth most active line in the, in the region. And so the goal there would be to look to implement uh, bus rapid transit service within the next several years. So bringing together all of these different studies and really a coordinated effort along with a zoning overlay that got adopted within the past year to really have a strong, walkable, neighborhood-oriented corridor. And the prospect corridor, and I think if we just transition there, I'll, I'll jump to Max first. Um, Max is uh, on its way. Um, we have a date of 2018, it may slide to 2019, getting the BRT service established on Prospect Avenue um, from 9th Street all the way down to, to 75th Street, I'm sorry, 12th to 75th Street. Um, we're working as a department to vet opportunities for redevelopment at 63rd and Prospect, 
Uh, we continue to work with Prosperity Playbook that was a HUD, a HUD initiative from several years ago, and we still use that as a, a framework as we continue to reach out to HUD, other federal agencies, um, local organizations working with the ATA to take a look at transit-oriented development um, that can happen along the corridor that would be spurred by the, the BRT's placement. Um, Eastside sales tax, what we have done there is we have taken um, a group of different city departments and agencies, so city planning development, finance, office economic development, performance management, and essentially what we're looking to do uh, is to create a baseline or kind of a foundation of facts about current condition within the, and I should probably say the one-eighth sales tax, not 8% sales tax approved by constituents. Um, but we felt it was important uh, to really have a foundation, so to have a set of data to be able to measure progress as those dollars get expended um, over the next the next 10 years. And then we have, there's a series of different developments that are happening all along Prospect. I think one of the biggest things we found in working with community is people have said, you know, we feel we have enough plans. Um, there is enough activity happening here in the corridor. We feel our job has really helped coordinate it to really identify those nodes of activity and really encourage people to, to build and grow from there. And then the last corridor is, is Troost. And again, we are looking at working with ATA. We have another PSP study to look at truce from 30th to 42nd Street. Uh, developments happening within this corridor. Now it's the idea of what's happening literally within the right of way and curb to curb. Truce has had an overall planning strategy where we started with communities on either side of the line looking to make sure there was better control about the land uses along the corridor. They've done that, then they wanted design guidelines, we've done the overlay, now they want to look at the right-of-way itself. Um, redevelopment at Armour and Troost, um, you're seeing the development along Armour Boulevard has made its way east and development coming south on Troost to really have that corner be a prime opportunity through eminent domain, there's been property control has been obtained, so looking for development within the next two to three years at all four of the corners there. So that's really a, I think it's really a major symbol for the city. Really kind of getting there and kind of bridging what people were perceiving as a, as a divide. Uh, again, we're seeing a lot of development activity happening on Troost. Um, LISC, you and I, um, with the city, we're working in the areas right at Troost between 31st and Linwood. There's properties there that clearly need to be repositioned. Um, you're seeing some development activity with the Board of Education's investments and new loft buildings coming from the north reaching that corridor, but it's really going to take an intensive effort to deal with that one particular block. Um, Squire Park is looking at down zoning. Um, so a variety of different planning tools and techniques are being put in place within the area. And then interestingly enough, Country Club Waldo, um, people might think about the geography and not think about Troost. Troost is right at its eastern edge. But we're starting to see a lot of activity on Troost south of the universities between the things that the universities are doing, uh, micro units being put in place. So you're starting to see that come together. So I'm hopeful that the energy working its way down south of Troost and development projects we've got in even in, in, as far south as 60th Street and all the activity along 63rd Street and east is going to put some positive pressure on 63rd and Troost. And so there are great opportunities there as well. So our involvement really is making sure we work with people to help set some long-term vision. We monitor individual projects that are happening and we make sure that we have in place the appropriate tools to be able to protect investments that people are making on the corridor. PSP, Planning Sustainable Places Projects, this is a federal funding we get through MARC and you see we have about seven different projects that are going on. Some I've mentioned earlier, but again, it's really looking at implementing multi multimodal complete street concepts and really you have streets where I think people could easily envision um, the kind of multimodal complete street concepts. Um, you're looking at places like Gillum Road. Um, you have other streets that are much more intensive in traffic, 39th Street, it's harder to achieve. But again, these corridors were recommended in area plans, lots of them in Midtown Plaza area plans, where we needed to go in and explore complete street concepts. So we're working Individual property owners clearly working with the right of way, working to make sure we have robust transit on corridors, really trying to work to create and enhance environments uh, where people will live 
and have a really great quality of life. Cool. Um, projections on the prospect corridor and, and what the max line may do. Is there a historic that, well, they're such different places. Because the max line on Maine is totally would be totally different than the max line on, on right. Prospect. But we are actually taking undertaking a study and working with Mark to understand the uh, economic benefits of TOD and bus rapid transit in particular. So hopefully in the coming months we'll have some findings from that study about that investment. It's really hard to um, to quantify, but we felt it was important at least to 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 do the study. And there's the understanding. I think people kind of feel anecdotally, you know, we're we're seeing. Um, improvement and infilling on those corridors. Um, but uh, I would say that's kind of a more to come situation, but we really are studying it. We're really trying to establish some baselines so we don't have to have the conversation about the transit investment from the perspective of is there any benefit or any economic benefit. Right. When's the max line going to be done on Prospect? 2019. Uh, mm. 2019. 2019. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Good job, Jeff. Oh, one more thing. Yes. Um, on, the, on the Troost uh, investment, what kind of investment are you seeing? and Where is it coming from? Uh, it's coming from a, a variety of different sources. I mean, the one project I mentioned, uh, UBC development, so uh, John Hoffman, Lance Carlton, um, that is coming in. There's another private developer that had something proposed for the east side of Troost down around 60th Street. So this is, this is kind of the private market. Um, there was an old Trucewood garage a little south of 55th Street that's getting converted into, into retail. So the market, uh, the private investment is identifying a market and seeing the potential. And fortunately, you know, through the pace of development here, this is happening pretty quickly. Um, it's happening, you know, within the last 24 months. So you really can see it. And that way I think we can be very optimistic about kind of reaching key intersections. And that's why I harp back at, at 63rd and Troost. Do you have all of this compiled in a document somewhere? Um, we have some documentation, but we can put together just kind of a chronology, a history of development, and especially looking at Troost from, I'd say let's we'll probably start plotting from Volcker Boulevard all the way south. And we probably should plot 63rd Street as well, because that's another really interesting case. I'm really you know, very, um, uh, uh, I'd like to be able to show the, uh, the, uh, the investments that are going on at Troost and East, okay. um, that seems to be a constant question, and I think we need to have those that information at our fingertips. Yep. Yeah. Do you have anything? No, I, I think that's a, that's a good point to pull that information. We've got we've been kind of tracking all we, those developments. We just need to constantly update, update it. it. Right. So we know we did a, a larger east side development. We could certainly update all those figures, but I think diving onto a corridor in particular would probably be very helpful. And I'm going to assume that the development um, fever has not extended quite to prospect, except in the areas that we've talked about uh, over in the Linwood Shopping Center area, et cetera. Yeah. I think we've had, you know, from a public sector, we've had to uh, provide some of that, that inspiration, but we see lots of opportunities. The 22nd, 23rd Street connector project at Prospect should be getting started in the next couple of months. And there's some, you're starting to see right. the private sector engage around 38, 39th right. Prospect. Um, so that all the investment yeah, there's a proposal is a that's floating senior housing, there, right? yeah. so correct. I, yeah, I think it's coming, it's just that it's been a lot of positive conversations. They need to translate into actual shovels and in the ground. But the, and what's interesting, it's it's folks that have done development other east on others in other parts of the community are now seeing investments along Prospect paying dividends. Okay, but that good. and that's where the planning process helps because you know that's a seven mile corridor or yeah. Prospect. So when we're able to signal. We're making a key investment here. We're rebuilding roads. We've got a transit stop. Something's happening. That signals to people where they should look when they're making investments along the corridor. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, next up, uh, Creative Spaces. Thank you, Megan Krieger. Uh, Director of Creative Services with a very long objective around uh, creative space development uh, and more importantly developing a plan to meet the needs uh, through planning and economic development partnerships. So last fall we partnered with our great partners EDC Corporation um, and thanks also to small business and many businesses and organizations that help promote this survey 
Um, it's a step in a larger feasibility process that looks at the potential to meet a multitude of community <coughs> priorities, for example, affordable housing, economic development, retention of the creative sector, and area revitalization. And so with this arts market, we were able to quantify the demand for artists and creative spaces, um, specifically the types of spaces that are needed. Uh, and then for art space, who conducted our survey, to look more specifically at potential site selections, um, design, and programmatic decisions for a potential uh, development here in Kansas City. Um, based on art space's experience in the field of affordable arts activity development, they uh, determined that there is substantial need for new space for creatives here. Um, we know that there are three elements that uh, help with artist creative business success. One is access to capital, resources, and equipment. The second being spaces that are both functional and affordable and three, a supportive arts community. And so when we look at uh, number one goal in the KCMO Arts Convergence Plan on how we support the creative sector, these are our three focused areas. Um, so uh, I'm gonna highlight just both the individual and business responses, but I'll note that the full technical report and recommendations can be found already on our website, kcmo.gov slash city manager's office slash creative services. Um, and before I get into what we have heard in terms of space needs, I do want to recognize some recently uh, developed um, projects, one being Kansas City Young Audiences on Main uh, that recently relocated, I guess, the beginning of this year, that is also now housing additional nonprofit organizations, Heart of American Shakespeare Festival, um, also Owen, Dance, Owen Cox Dance, KC Rep, and KC Actors Theaters all use that space for rehearsal, so it's meeting a short-term rental need. Um, I also, because it comes up quite often, want to recognize the Pendleton Arts Block, which is uh, part of the Paseo Gateway Choice Neighborhood Project. Um, that is, will have 38 units. Uh, that is specifically for uh, creative live workspace. But I also rec want to recognize that a lot of that is uh, dedicated for relocation, then leaving fewer available for new residents coming in. Um, and uh, this year, the NEA Our Town grant we did receive, we're now two and two for getting Our Town grants, and Charlotte Street Foundation is just about to cinch the deal on uh, space, which I think is an old payday loan along Troost Avenue that will provide a studio working space while also being uh, having a focus on being a neighborhood resource. Um, so uh, there are city efforts all over the country that is struggling playing out uh, how to manage urban rent skyrocketing and wages that are stagnating. Um, musicians and artists co uh, continually being displaced and experiments are happening like such um, affordable housing and multi-use development looking beyond just federal low-income housing tax credits. Uh, while we recognize that city cancel, uh, city, uh, Kansas City is not lacking in affordable housing stock, the objective is to take a deeper look at the kinds of spaces um, that function and ensuring affordability and perpetuity in Kansas City. I mean, it's this affordability and functional spaces that's important in the strategy to attract and retain our creative talent. So getting into uh, the, the respondents, we had a total of 616 respondents to the survey, and that was both individual artists, creative businesses, arts and cultural nonprofit organizations. Um, the survey captured not only space needs, but demographics, household uh, income, um, derived from creative work, the kind of disciplines uh, that people are making their living from, and preferring, preferred housing locations. Uh, as you can see on the right, individual artists represented a variety of uh, disciplines and creative pursuits. The most common was painting and drawing, music, literary arts, and digital media. Um, we found that 68% are interested in relocating to a live-work housing unit, and what's also interesting, because this was a regional uh, survey, was that about 33% have 
either lived here and no longer live here or just have never lived in Kansas City. So that's pro approximately half that we're showing a demand and an attraction for people to then move into KCMO with the right kind of um, creative space use. And then 65% were interested in ongoing s studio and creative workspace. And of that, 36 are also located outside of uh, the city limits of KCMO. 62% uh, indicated an interest in short-term and occasional access to shared creative space or specialized equipment, which I'll go into a little bit of detail what that means in a minute. Uh, but through this, we learned also that 47% of the respondents' household incomes are at or below 60% of uh, area median income for Kansas City, and I point that out mainly to differentiate between uh, individual artists and their motive for business as opposed to the for-profit uh, uh, businesses where there's less of a motivation to create profit and, and much more about experience and quality of life from their work. So uh, again, to focus on affordability and perpetuity is a goal for the sustainability of the creative sector. Uh, moving on to the organizations, there was also a variety of disciplines that were um, represented from music businesses to arts education and to festivals as well as visual and performing arts organizations. Uh, they ranged from new and emerging businesses, there was a small percentage, to more than half being established here in Kansas City for more than 10 years. Of the 101 businesses uh, that responded, a significant percentage, about 70%, are interested in renting creative space with interest in both long-term and short-term or occasional rental use. Uh, and of these that expressed interest in affordable space, 79% are located here in KCMO with 21% uh, expressing interest in relocating to Kansas City, Missouri with the right availability and use of creative space. So then on to the recommendations, which is the next slide. Uh, based on the survey results, the recommendation to create, uh, to support the creative sector of the low income community and ensure their long term presence in the city and help stabilize the small creative businesses and nonprofits through affordable space. Uh, such a facility could be uh, accepted in the market. This is based on a three to one formula. Re redundancy methodology applied to the data set is about up to 60 units of affordable live work residential apartments and up to 40 units of affordable private studio workspaces. Um, we're also seeing that two to 3,000 square feet of creative commercial space uh, could be accommodated, and that would include retail office, food service, in addition to co-working and shared maker space. Um, not listed here, but it also uh, could handle a 99, an additional 99 to 300 seat theater with low rental costs. Um, so what do we mean by shared uh, equipment? Because that was high on the list for both individual artists and businesses. Um, we found that the top priorities were shared computers with design software, music recording studios, classroom teaching spaces, and then also a priority, but not quite as high, are rehearsal spaces for theater and performing arts, and co-working spaces and maker space with digital fabrication tools right around at 21 percent. Um, there's obviously other factors that need to be considered when influencing a final project concept, and that would, of course, be funding priorities, um, civic leader priorities, and site opportunities and those restrictions that come with it, um, as well as planned or, ex or executed local development projects. And so uh, in our next iteration, working close, continuing to work with the EDC, looking at all of those as priorities in addition to um, properties that would be available uh, for art space as a potential nonprofit developer coming in. Uh, so we're sort of just now starting to do diaper, uh, deeper dives, having also shared those space requirements with our economic development office and our planning office because we know that they have uh, eyes and boots on the ground. Uh, the second part of Megan, this quickly, can, yes. can you say what the, a space like that looks like in another city or, or examples you've seen and what they 
um, you know, what they do for a, a local community in a neighborhood? Yes. Um, they, arts, for example, Art Space is, is the only nonprofit developer that I'm aware of that provides space specifically for creatives. And I think they have over 20 developments all over the country, um, half a million dollars in assets. And oftentimes, a city will lead the priority for uh, why those developments come in. They could be to anchor affordability in areas that are already seeing market rate increases. And so it ins ensures that creatives are able to um, stay within the urban core and have a stabilized income. Uh, another priority, which I think is the affinity for Kansas City, is seeing this as an opportunity for revitalization. And so there are uh, cities that have deliberately located a development such as this has been a catalyst for then uh, an attraction for other development to, to come into place. So um, those are the two, two options that we're seeing. And in the report, actually, it gives end of presentation is also online, numerous other cities and the examples of those multi-use. And they range from uh, uh, historical sort of reuse, where they're getting historical tax credits, uh, to, on a very rare occasion, a more dispersed approach uh, within a neighborhood where they're using residential units and some commercial. So, yeah. Um, the second part, and I'll keep this moving along unless there are other questions. Um, yes, sir. You know, I, I see potential dating, if not marriage, between mm -hmm. spatial requirements and the corridors that Jeffrey was talking about. It yes. seems to me that there are some possibilities there. And I know at one point in time you were talking about looking at a place out on 63rd Street. Did that ever materialize? 63rd. 63rd. Uh, were you in that meeting? Yes. Yeah. And I'm trying to remember which property that was on 63rd. It was one um, just east of Truce, if I'm not mistaken. It wasn't an ideal property. No, because it for was some reason. it was market rate and oh, yeah, actually a little inflated, work. right? Yeah, so they're looking for cheap to free. Okay. <laughs> um, but we do have our our eyes set on a couple of other properties, working closely with the Kansas City Public School. District, and it, uh, so and, and, well, and yes. the public schools. I'm sorry, that was the exact word. I mean, okay. looking for prototypes for facilities like this. Lots of communities have used former public schools yes. because they have the classroom space and the auditorium okay. space. Those are perfect prototypes. Yeah. They're ideal. Yeah, but we're not looking at 18th and Vine. It's a whole other property further south and east. South and east? Uh huh. South and east. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> we love the attics. They love the attics, but it has a long line of good potentials lined up for attics. Okay, cool. So. Mm -hmm. It does make sense. The 18th and Vine is. Uh -huh. it, and I think it would help to extend the east crossroads into that direction. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, real quickly, because the second part of this objective is about developing a plan for then meeting those creative needs, and we recognize that one development's not going to serve all of our needs. Um, so this data is valuable, and we hope that it has a bit of a shelf life. If you want to go on to the next slide, Julie. Um, we'll continue working with EDC and other relevant city departments and other development agencies to share the results of this data because we believe if they understand there's a market demand, they may be more willing to provide these kinds of spaces. Um, the opportunity for this is um, obviously it would be less expensive to have the kind of multi-use um, facility, uh, both residential and commercial. But we also, and but we hope that this helps to bridge arts and development communities and build momentum for more creative spaces. Um, it helps to build an ecosystem of affordable space options for uh, the creative community and could provide much needed space for the 120 creatives desiring uh, workspace as well. Um, the third, the second approach for this developing a strategy and a plan is think about uh, anchor tenants. And it could be, if you want to go on to the next slide, Julie, it could be industry specific, but, but just partnering up some of our anchor arts organizations and businesses with existing development. And so probably over the next six months, we'll be putting together infographics, something really easy that can be shared with um, uh, 
uh, incoming businesses and corporations looking to expand and how we can start to, to partner some of these um, creatives with development. And then I have one last slide, because I would be remiss in not uh, men mentioning our Arts and Economic Prosperity Study. Uh, this is the third, it happens every five years, and it's conducted through the Americans for the Arts uh, National Organization. This is the third study for the metro region, which Arts KC locally administers. But it's the very first one that we've done for the city of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, so we start to see some of that direct local revenue and state revenue, which I can report here on this uh, slide. Overall, the city of Kansas City, Missouri, um, has generated 200, or arts and culture nonprofits, uh, $244 million in total economic activity, with about $161 million by nonprofit organizations and an additional $82 million by event-related spending by their audiences. And that number is calculated uh, with everything excluding ticket sales. So it's a uh, cost uh, to go to restaurants and to retail and to pay the babysitter, uh, everything but tickets. Uh, this, These graphs, which I have to say, I pulled the numbers together, but thanks to Julie, uh, they now look beautiful and make sense. Um, the blue is Kansas City's economic uh, impact numbers. The Gray is, so it's comparing us to the study region median, so cities of our comparable size, so you can see that we far exceed what is typical for our, our size. And then the green on the right represents the economic impact within the five county region, so you can see that we're taking up, or making up a very large chunk of what the entire metro region is, is uh, generating. So with those numbers, uh, this KCMO supports about 7,500 full-time equivalent jobs. As an example, that's 74% of the metro nonprofit arts jobs. Uh, we're also generating $220 million in household income to local residents and delivering about $18.8 .8 million in local and state government revenue, and that can actually be broken out in the study, but I don't have that here with me. Um, and the last point I want to make is that uh, you may have heard that cultural tourists spend twice as much as the average tourist. Um, in Kansas City, Missouri, it's about $10 more per person. The cultural tourist spends about $10 more than a resident. Um, and what's interesting is that the national average for um, attendance is about 32% of visitors attending arts events. In Kansas City, we're showing 66% of attendees are visitors. Now, granted, we have a unique geographic uh, bi-state area, but given that the visitors and culture tourists are spending more, this is an area that we want to focus on uh, in partnership with Arts KC and Visit KC on how we conti can continue to grow uh, the cultural tourism component. Michelle. All right, uh, we have about 45 minutes left, so um, we'll just keep rolling. Uh, implement uh, programs for, for small business. So, John, Rick. Good morning. So I'll, I'll roll through this fairly quickly. Um, I wanted to show this to you, this job creation by small businesses. This is really a new data set that our friends over at KC SourceLink have developed. They explored a database called the Quarterly Census of Employment and Wages. And um, maybe this would only excite a small business person, but um, for the first time, we really, they can put some numbers on the number of jobs that firms with 20 employees and fewer are creating on an annual basis. So the chart that we have up in front of us shows between 2012 and 2016, the number of jobs that small firms in Kansas City, and this is broken out specifically for Kansas City, are creating on an annual basis. So um, I think it's a pretty, pretty solid impact. I also have the numbers metro-wide. I'll just give you one example. So in 2016, in the metropolitan area, small businesses created 16,000 jobs. This, you know, we're a little less than half the number of those jobs are happening in Kansas City, Missouri. 
I'll go on to the next slide. Um, so other good news for the Kansas City uh, small business scene. This is additional data that SourceLink put together through their We Create Capital report. And if you will see the chart, notice that those blue lines uh, have increased dramatically in the last five years. What that means is, as many of you know, uh, there's been a lot of work done in Kansas City to increase local investment in small business. You know, one of the things you've heard for quite a long time is that if you want to get funding for your tech venture or your new venture, you've got to go to the coast and you've got to seek outside investments. Well, that landscape is changing and it's changing dramatically. So that bar chart indicates that in the, this is the number of investors in the Kansas City metro area that are investing in small startup businesses. As you see that blue line, it's really increased quite a bit. So now in 2016, we actually had more local investors than we did outside investors. So that's good news for Kansas City, keeping those small businesses here. A um, couple of other bullet points. Um, let's see, they're showing up on, oh, on this slide. Uh, good news from um, our friends over at All Cap, Ruben Alonzo. They were just awarded nearly $700,000 from the Department of Treasury to increase their microloan fund to small business. And um, as many of you know, our Human Relations Department is partnered with Lead Bank for the Four Change Initiative so that uh, city, uh, small businesses get a contract with the city will have better access to capital and better access to bonding. Quite important, particularly for those construction firms. So I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, we worked recently with, with Julie and um, Dylan Wood to do a customer service survey. We, we wanted to get some feedback on what people are wanting from our office. So you see the, the highest column in that chart, 43% of our customers want more workshops on topics related to small business. Um, so I'm gonna move on really to the next slide because one of the things we've been working on very hard is more workshops for small business. So we just recently partnered with a local attorney, Adrian Haynes of the Seed Law Firm. She did a series, one of the most frequent questions that we get as an office is about legal requirements and what are the legal requirements for starting a small business. So um, we put on a workshop called Business Law for Entrepreneurs. We did three of them uh, within the last three months. One of them was in Spanish. We uh, cooperated with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and HEDC, so um, that was just a, an exciting thing for us to do. In uh, many of you know, in November, Global Entrepreneurship Week is coming up, so we'll be doing three workshops for Global Entrepreneurship Week. One, our friends over at the IRS on the exciting topic of taxes. Uh, we'll be doing working with the Pekin City, Missouri Public Library. We're doing one on research for small business, and the one I'm most excited about. We're bringing in a panel of experts. Something we had a lot of questions about lately is e-commerce. How do I change from having a physical storefront to having an online store, or how do I upgrade my physical storefront with an online store? So we're putting together a panel of experts on the topic of e-commerce, and um, so we're, we're looking forward to that. Uh, next slide just shows some of our data for number of clients served. Um, we saw a peak in 20. 15, which was really related to Uber, because you know they're not licensed anymore, so you won't be seeing those folks. But uh, this year, for the first th uh, this first quarter, we're about 20% ahead of the number of clients that we're seeing from last year. I think that's because we're doing a lot of outreach. We're hitting the social media pretty hard to let people know we're out there. We're advertising. In some, bless you. Advertising in some new publications doing a lot of public presentations, particularly to our partners that do small business workshops. We get out there and tell them about our services. So um, I'll bump over to the next slide. As many of uh, as Troy knows, we uh, underwrite, work with our, our, pa our partners over at the UMKC Small Business Technology Development Center to under underwrite many of the costs of many of their workshops. And that's been a very popular program. Good. So. They're only two months into their fiscal year. Uh, we uh, underwrote the cost of about 90 <coughs> small business workshops. They've already used about 62% of those scholarships for the workshops just in the first two months of this year. So um, actually, we, that's really good news. Hopefully, we'll run out of those scholarships because the last thing we want is to get to the end of the year and we've got scholarships that weren't used. So the good news is we're way ahead of schedule on that. And that's all I have.
And if I could throw in on the Urban Business Growth Initiative, this is our um, fourth year, that agreement contract with UMKC Innovation Center and the Small Business Technology Development Center. Um, Carmen DeHart gives us an annual report every year at the Small Business Committee and in March <coughs> reported that the program was responsible for $29 million in increased sales of the businesses that participated, uh, $4.2 million in ongoing equity investment, and uh, 15 business startups, 83 new jobs, and uh, 129 retained jobs, and nearly three million in government contracts to uh, those companies participating. Uh, Tech Week uh, was uh, here in our, uh, I believe it's the third year, the 11th through the 15th. Um, 5,500 or so attendees across uh, events. This year the uh, event was <coughs> split up across a um, number of locations around the city. Previously, we centered it in Union Station. This got more people out in the community to see the scope and scale of what's happening in the startup entrepreneur community. Um, and the event culminates in uh, Launch KC Award. There were uh, 400 submittals from across. The, do you have information on this one, too? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, we'll cover it when we get there. Yeah, it's it's later in the show. Okay. If you want. <laughs> we put it it, it's coming. Here, so <laughs> I don't want to talk over what uh, Bob might be presenting in there, but uh, which which slide are we on then? The economic mobility slide. Yep. All right. So in, in the uh, strategic plan, um, we two years ago had a plan for. Uh, digital equity strategic plan that led to conversations among staff at our planning meetings on creating this plan for economic mobility of uh, residents so the health department is leading this initiative among a group of uh, city departments including the city manager's office PC biz care uh, economic development uh, city planning and uh, what else we got in there Jeff we got uh, <laughs> well, housing, well, neighbors housing, and housing services housing involved. So, uh, the, the 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 goal of this plan, though, is to define a path through a, a lot of the programs we've been discussing here. How do I learn the tech skills to get involved in the urban business growth initiative? How do I uh, learn how to grow a company to participate in Launch KC? So we lace together the organizations and programs in the city into an easily defined path for residents depending on you know their interests then then we, we think we've got strong community support in our entrepreneurial community uh, next slide and this um, has been a theme of showing where our efforts are centered uh, across housing planning uh, small business group economic development that we're really using data and, and uh, connectivity information to show that um, LifeX, um, the digital equity plan, our economic mobility goals are all centered on the same residential population that we're, we're trying to uh, move the needle on uh, economic statistics. Yeah, I can cover these. So uh, in an effort to continue to uh, evolve the resident survey to help us really know what's going on in the community, we added a section um, and we have one quarter's worth of data uh, really that center around questions of uh, economic mobility, um, community health, kind of the old can I go to my neighbor and borrow a cup of sugar type questions. And so um, that was really in partnership with the health department who um, gave up some of their service questions in order to make space for these. And so we're already starting to see some of those dividends even just after one quarter of adding these questions. So you can see um, this question is uh, particularly really related to that economic mobility concept of are you doing better in your um, economic condition, uh, your financial condition than you would say your parents were doing. And you can see for Kansas City um, overall uh, the um, 
excellent and good there. Um, takes us a, a, above a, ma a majority of our residents, but then average to poor, um, still a, a decent percentage. Uh, I don't think that's what we would say we'd want for our residents. So um, good data to have. And then also looking at that uh, across tabulated across income groups, you can see where that um, also puts the disproportional burden on our uh, residents with under $30,000 household income. As you can see on the next slide, uh, a different question in that same section, um, uh, asking about standard of living. So um, what would you say your, your standard of living is compared to um, your, your parents? I'm sorry, that first question was actually just purely about your own financial condition. This is the more economic development or economic mobility question. And you can see here, uh, same trend sort of applies uh, with majority of our residents saying, I'm doing somewhat better to much better than my parents were doing, but then still a, a pretty high percentage of our residents saying that they are about the same or not doing as well as their, their family. And, and again, you can see how that breaks out by um, different uh, income levels. And so we'll continue to monitor this. Again, this is one quarter of data. We'll have another quarter uh, at the third quarter in the spring. So we'll have final numbers um, for everyone probably by the next KC stat on this topic. Um, but something we can cross tab by a lot of different demographic factors and just look at to help help us guide the conversation about what policies and, and city programs and partnerships we should pursue. All right, and that actually takes us into digital inclusion. Um, and per Rick, we've put a check mark on the adopt because we did so in March um, of this year. So um, take it away. Yeah, so, so now we're in the uh, implementation phase. This slide are uh, questions from and results from the, uh, what, which, which sort of- This is from our is uh, resident from survey. From March or? Uh, uh, this is going to be from FY17. From 17, okay. So it's just showing um, how internet uh, usage is being adopted citywide. Um, it trends downward with age. Um, it trends downward with uh, based on income. Um, there's an ethnicity uh, gap in uh, internet adoption. And um, We've seen the statistics that internet adoption is lowest in the, uh, the third district. And this, again, is helping us to focus our efforts through the Kansas City Coalition for Digital Inclusion with uh, our council members and with the community on uh, addressing the needs of residents in, in these parts of the city. Yeah, and I do, I do want to chime in. Uh, we did look at a chart asking, you know, uh, we, we have a question that's set aside from race and ethnicity, ethnicity that asks, you know, do you consider yourself Latino, essentially? And when we looked at that, uh, we didn't really see a difference between people who compare themselves to, uh, or who said on the survey that they are Latino or have Spanish ancestry or that they did not. Uh, and th that was interesting to see that there wasn't as much of an internet access gap there. Um, but we didn't include it on the slide because you can only stick so many charts on a slide. Right. Okay. Uh, this is the, uh, these are the six points of um, our digital inclusion strategic plan. Um, as I was stating, we're pursuing these through the Coalition for Digital Inclusion, um, using these <coughs> to demonstrate to residents uh, in, in hand in hand with our economic mobility strategy of internet use for finding employment, education, and, and business and job creation. Next slide. Uh, some ongoing programs, Connect Home, um, Kansas City Housing Authority in the city. We were pilot program partners with Connect Home through HUD. Uh, in this administration, it's being managed through Everyone On, uh, Connect Home Nation. Um, we're working with the Housing Authority to become a mentor city in that, which means that we would uh, work with housing authorities now throughout the region and really throughout HUD Region 7 uh, to implement that program. Uh, high point of that was that Google Fiber connected over 1,300 housing authority residents with free gigabit speed internet services. Uh, there are six access uh, lounges, they call them, community learning centers, that are now 
staffed um, with training programs and other information sessions by uh, members of the Coalition for Digital Inclusion. Uh, digital equity partnership with uh, uh, eStewards. This is a brand new program that we've participated in. We're an eSteward enterprise. Uh, we've been in that capacity with eStewards for about three years where we donate our surplus computers, uh, surplus exchange refurbishes them. Uh, they've in that time uh, built out two uh, community learning center labs, one at Morningstar Family Life Center, 19 computers and furniture, uh, one at uh, Seacon, a, a, a local church with a number of computers, um, and that, that program is continuing. But through the E Digital Equity Partnership, um, we're uh, the first city to join in that. San Francisco just signed on. I think Seattle might have just signed on. Um, high point of uh, uh, the uh, Higher Casey Youth Program, we had two uh, high school interns that did our Community Learning Center Network current state assessment. They identified, I believe, 78 locations throughout the city that you can go to get free access to the internet and computers. Um, we're taking the next phase of that, working with uh, a steam village and with you know, UMKC and our coalition to further define that. And then through the library, prototyping um, the optimal community learning center, and we're looking at Garrison and Parks and Rec as a partner there. All right, that takes us to the end of that section. Uh, any questions or any question comments from Twitter? Okay. All right, uh, moving on, economic development strategies. Uh, first up is the um, economic development strategic plan. Okay, good morning. Uh, Carrie Tyndall, City Manager's Office, Office of Economic Development. Um, so at our last KC stat, um, we really kind of were talking about the status of the implementation of the plan. Um, and we also noted some emerging issues uh, that were not addressed in deep detail uh, when that plan was originally written back in 2012. Um, but there have been um, conversations that have been bubbling up since then, um, which we've started to touch on this, uh, this morning, including housing affordability and social equity. Um, so what we wanted to try and do today was to talk a little bit about sort of what some of the metrics are that helps us evaluate how we're doing relative to those strategies. Um, because of the fact that the plan is five years old, that means that the competitive snapshot data that was done in conjunction with that plan is also five years old. And so we wanted to start looking at where we were um, going, what some of the trends were relative to some of those metrics. Uh, so in collaboration with the Office of Performance Management and City Planning, uh, we uh, have started to try and take kind of a first crack at that. Um, we have not been able to do a comprehensive update of that competitive snapshot although that's certainly something that we would be interested in doing. Um, it's just a matter of identifying the resources either internally or externally to be able to do that. Um, in the past couple of years, we've requested some additional funding for an update to the strategic plan, which could include an update to the indicators as well. Um, but if we're not able to do that, then we certainly want to try to do whatever we can in-house. And we have a lot of really um, um, talented staff in terms of data metrics here within the city. So we'll uh, keep trying to work with them and see what we can do. So next slide. Um, the, um, actually, back up one more. One thing I wanted to just remind people about in terms of the framework of the Advanced Kansas City Strategic Plan, um, that um, plan was organized um, and grouped into three factors that are crucial to the economic health of Kansas City. It's people, their prosperity, and the quality of its place. So um, what we did with this exercise was try to get a little bit of a um, representative sampling of some of the major indicators under each one of those categories. Um, and so, next slide. Um, uh, again, in collaboration with the other departments, we uh, tried to pull some of the statistics from the most recent 2015 data and compare that to the baselines from the original Advanced Kansas City um, and see kind of where those um, trends were headed. Um, so here we've pulled some statistics relative to population and educational attainment and tried to look at where we are now in comparison to um, the study that was done originally in the benchmarks that were used for that. Um, uh, 
as you can see from this information, the population is growing um, a little over 3%, but uh, many other cities around the country are growing much faster than Kansas City is right now. Um, we also saw some increases of, in percentages in our population who uh, were attaining high school degrees, bachelor's degrees, and graduate degrees. Um, so there may be some shifting there in terms of uh, focus more on completing the higher levels of educational attainment versus just completing a portion of those um, college degrees. We, we would have to dive deeper into the statistics to find out kind of what's driving that, but I think that it's a good positive trend over overall that we're seeing increases in our overall population in terms of that those educational attainment levels. Next slide. So that was the people category. Um, then in prosperity, we looked at some wage data, some patent data, and some unemployment data. So if you remember, um, when we did this plan, we were coming out of the Great Recession, and so the baseline um, unemployment data at that time was still uh, pretty um, challenged. And so that uh, it, Kansas City was at a 10% unemployment rate at that time. Since then, we've come down to an unemployment rate of about 5.7%. So that was a huge de <coughs> decrease in unemployment. Um, we have seen also some increases in average wages across the three county area of about um, almost 11%. And also, um, which I, I see as particularly um, um, uh, promising that our patent activity has increased um, over 30 percent. So patent activity is sort of an indicator of R&D activity. I think that it also is indirectly related to some of our activity in the entrepreneurial support um, area of the city. And so um, seeing that we're increasing in that area, I think, is a good indicator that we've got some um, 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 ba some bottom-up economic development and innovation going on in the community, and that's really good to see. Um, then next slide. Um, metrics on place. We looked at um, some median home values um, some crime data, and some housing affordability data. So in terms of median home values, um, it doesn't look like much has changed between 2010 and 2015 across the overall city. Um, we do continue to have lower median home values than the average across the U.S., um, but obviously that kind of changes um, uh, seasonally um, as well. Um, so that's just kind of a a really an aggregate five-year period. Um, in terms of the um, crime rates, um, one thing that I um, was recently told, which I think is going to be great, is that the police department is apparently working on some new software to be able to allow us to more readily access some of our crime um, statistics data. Um, uh, but for this particular exercise, we pulled some data from city data um, and tried to kind of um, replicate the process that was done in 2010 for um, advanced Kansas City so that we could have an apples to apples comparison. And based on that, um, the violent crime has gone up, and but the property crimes have gone down. Again, I think that those rates tend to fluctuate quite a bit year over year. So um, that would be probably one that we would want to look at some more year over year statistics and more long term trends. Um, and then um, on the housing affordability, which is a big topic um, lately, we've got some activity going on in the housing committee. This kind of ties back to our economic mobility conversation earlier. Um, we've been trying to figure out, you know, whether or not um, uh, the housing in our community is affordable and accessible to our residents. Um, this is an indicator that. Uh, kind of looks at things from an overall global picture. Um, so the National Association of Realtors has something called the Affordability Index of Existing Single-Family Homes for Metropolitan Statistical um, Areas. And um, the way that they do this index is that they um, a value of 100 means that a family with a median income has exactly enough income to qualify for a mortgage on a median-priced home. And that's based on an assumption that they have a 20% down payment. So if you have an index above 100, that means you're more affordable. It's easier for families to afford it. And obviously, the higher that score, the more affordable. If it goes below, then that obviously <laughs> indicates that things are not affordable. So you want to be as far above 100 as you possibly can. So 
for Kansas City for the 2015 data, um, the index for us was 233.6. And just to kind of give you some context for how, how that shakes out, um, I did pull some statistics for some of our peer cities that we compared ourselves to in advanced Kansas City. Um, Oklahoma City has a um, has a higher index than us, meaning they're slightly more affordable at 245.9. Indianapolis is also more more affordable at 251.8, but Charlotte is significantly less affordable at 183.1, and then St. Louis is about the same. So. I would say that Midwestern cities tend to be a lot more affordable, and then as you get on the coasts, then that affordability um, significantly goes down. Um, I'm, we have not yet looked at that at a sub-geographic uh, level, but I think that utilizing the methodology that they did for the index, we may be able to um, take that in conjunction with some of the market value analysis and maybe dive deeper into that and figure out some affordability indexes for some sub-geographic areas within the city. So next slide. Um, so why is all of this important? Um, while Kansas City has a wealth of competitive assets that position us for great success in the future, um, we have lagged behind other areas in other areas compared to peer cities. And um, many of those competitive issues were also noted in the Brookings report that came out um, after the Advanced Kansas City Strategic Plan. And I just put some uh, kind of a checklist of some of the factors that Amazon is using in their um, current RFP uh, in terms of sort of what it takes to be a, um, a competitive city for future economic development. And, and um, some have commented that the Amazon RFQ is very much a checklist of what cities um, should be focusing on. Um, and so um, if you look at um, sort of our competitive assets and, and some of our competitive issues, you know, there are some things on the asset area that line up very well with um, the, the, those types of opportunities, but there are other areas where, you know, we um, definitely could focus more resources. And the purpose of taking a look at this really is to um, help us um, make good policy decisions and target our resources towards those things that are most strategically impactful towards our ability to um, remain and improve our competitiveness um, nationally and globally. All right, EDC activity. Um, good morning. I'm Bob Langenkamp with the Economic Development Corporation in Kansas City. Um, this first slide talks about uh, sort of uh, our basic goals. Um, EDC has a nine-member board, which I must say is one of the finest boards you could assemble uh, in the area. Maybe that went right Got by the them. Um, a couple of these are the... <laughs> put it right there. We're the only two board members. <laughs> um, Basically, one of one of our fundamental uh, goals is the number of jobs that we're successful. Getting any raise? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and tell the rest of the story. Just yeah. on out. talk on. Um, one of our fundamental goals is trying to attract 3,500 new jobs into Kansas City, Missouri. So this first uh, first uh, line is tracking where we are. Basically, we are 42% of the way through the fiscal year. This is through September, um, and we're at 45% on the reaching the goal. So we are slightly ahead of the goal at this point. Track the amount of new payroll. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, a second fundamental goal that the EDC has is the amount of private investment that goes through the processes established by Advanced KC for the review and evaluation of those projects. And our target is to do about a billion dollars worth of that each fiscal year. And you can see we're about 38% uh, of the way. So we're a little behind on that one. Um, uh, jobs that are, uh, have salaries over 46,000, 46 is a, a metro, uh, sorry, Kansas City, Missouri average wage. So are we getting jobs in that are above the average wages? Uh, and then also that we retain uh, jobs and that we retain at least 75% of the jobs that come into play. And this 
This relates into situations where companies have grown out of their space, they need to expand, their location comes up in the air, do they end up going to uh, a Kansas community, a suburban community, do we, are we successful keeping them in Kansas City, Missouri? Uh, and at this point, knock on wood, we've been very successful. We haven't lost any of those. Go to the next one, Julie. Um, in looking at uh, job attraction, this shows, no, I'm sorry, this is the uh, real estate development. Uh, this shows last fiscal year, uh, uh, prior, EDC runs on the same fiscal year schedule as the city does, so this would have been through April 30th of 2017. Um, am I looking at this right? Yes, okay. Um, so here's the investment. Uh, the $804 million is sort of traditional real estate buildings and those kind of improvements. In addition to that, there was another $270 million worth of personal property that was developed. Uh, so when a company goes in, uh, occupies a space, there's an investment that takes place in the physical building and real estate. There's also investment that takes place in everything from office furniture to computers and those sort of elements. So there's a real property and a personal property. Uh, and so the real property was 804 million and the personal property was over 270 million. Uh, the next line down just shows sort of uh, where, what types of projects there were. And last year, 2017, fiscal 2017, uh, you can see we did a lot of residential projects. Uh, you can drive around Kansas City and see all those underway. Uh, and there was also actually a fair amount of hotel and commercial projects. Um, this is the current then fiscal year where we are at this point. Again, sort of the same approach. Um, we've done 310 million. We have 200, about $268 million worth of projects that are in the review processes right now. Um, generally, most of those end up coming through, not all of them. Some get turned down <coughs> occasionally. But that's a pretty good indication of uh, where we are trending so far this fiscal year. Uh, and again, we have the breakdown of the different categories, uh, the types of uses, and you can see, for instance, that the residential number has dropped pretty significantly as a percentage of the overall development compared to what we had last year. Uh, if you want to go to the next one, uh, Rick had mentioned Launch KC a little bit ago. This is a, the Launch KC is a program that we partner with the downtown council to run. This is a annual international program uh, to identify and support uh, startup uh, companies. We've had international companies that have come in and won. Uh, this is the third year now that we have done this. Um, this has sort of the dashboard, if you will, of what happened this current fiscal year. We do $500,000 worth of grants. Uh, these grants for 10 companies, so basically $50,000 per company. We do not acquire an ownership interest in these companies, so it's not, uh, doesn't dilute their ownership. We provide free space for a year, and then they have greatly discounted space for the second year. There's mentoring support, uh, all kinds of tech assistance. And this part of this is trying to strengthen the small business and entrepreneurial community in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, you can see some of the stats from this year. Uh, we've gone back, since this is the third year, we've gone back and taken a look at the classes of uh, 2015 and 2016. Uh, for instance, those 20 awardees, when they started, had a total of 53 uh, full-time FTEs, full-time employees. They're now doubled that up to 113 employees. Um, their payroll at the start was about 2.7 million. It's now up to 5.1 million. 
um, 17 of these 20 companies still exist and are still in Kansas City. And quite honestly, that was a little bit of higher success and retention rate than, than a lot of us thought we'd succeed. I think part of it has to do with the quality of the judging and the evaluation of being very successful at picking out companies, startups that are really ready to go and really have a good chance of surviving. Um, we have 16 patent applications in, one have been granted so far. Uh, and, you know, we've done these $500,000 grants, but one of the things that winning this award has done is it's identified these companies as companies that really can be successful. And so they've attracted over $15 million in additional capital outside of what our program has provided. Uh, so this has been pretty important. Um, I'm going to jump way back to the Visit KC comment about uh, cuts. One of the big financial supporters of this program for us is the Missouri Technology Corporation. Uh, Missouri Technology Corporation's budget was cut from somewhere between 22 and 23 million dollars down to five. Wow, uh, it's pretty significant statistically. Yeah. Uh, we, stu we still do have funding for next year's program, but we don't know beyond that. Uh, and so as we look at uh, support uh, from the state of Missouri from different programs, it's, it's hit what's happening with Visit KC. It also has a potential to really affect this program. Uh, and the state of Missouri has already made their money back that has come through the Missouri Technology Corporation. Um, We're just not making investments in the right places at the state level. Well, it, 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 it's, uh, it's been a huge help. I don't think no, I mean we couldn't have yeah, got the program the off the cuts. ground. Yeah. That's right. Wrong, wrong approach. So. Thank you. Are there any questions? You got any questions got for us? All right. Couple like your job. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Particularly the leadership I received. Of course. Wow. It's an annual that something time. I don't know what it is. <laughs> All right. A couple of very quick um, objectives, Carrie, uh, incentives. Okay. Um, next slide really quick. Um, so I just wanted to give you a quick update on the status of the incentives analysis project. When we uh, met last time, I think uh, there was a little uncertainty in terms of what our um, project schedule was, and that was because we were really kind of knee deep in the um, process of the data collection and the data vetting and trying to kind of get our arms around what we were dealing with. Um, I am very pleased to report that we have completed the data collection and data vetting process as of the end of September. Um, it was a very complicated and challenging process to get through. Um, we have three different counties that we're dealing with um, tax data from and their methods of capturing and reporting that data vary and so we had to go through a process uh, what I kind of call a Rosetta Stone um, process of trying to standardize that and understand and translate that into one comprehensive set of data. But we passed that off um, at the end of September. And so now this project's really in the hands of the consulting team because they have their data set um, to do their analysis with. And so um, right now they're in the process of really getting um, their economic impact and geospatial modeling models rerun. Um, and then um, we will see over the next several um, months them um, putting together the draft report. And um, as of the most recent conversation I had with them, we are expecting to see the final report from them by the end of the calendar year this year. Good. Thanks, Terry. Mm -hmm. All right. Last um, ob objective is about the uh, city planning development service improvement plan and again I was liberal with the check marks because it is complete yes thank you done on, ongoing <laughs> but no, done. Right. and done and I, I think the other one just from process perspective we're all working on compass KC which will be important for streamlining business processes across a number of different departments here in the city and we're looking at go live dates now in the middle of February of 2018 All right, that takes us to the end. Uh, any questions? 
All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.